studio. My name is Dan Rubenstein. I am joined by, as you look across the screen, hopefully it is Bill Connolly somewhere in Missouri. Uh, I believe that's how you say it. Jason Kirk in Atlanta and Spencer Hall also in Atlanta with varying degrees of facial hair. We form the selection committee. Uh, the intended purpose of the show is to figure out who the four best teams are in college football each week as if the college football playoff were starting in 2013 and it is very much not so we were going to we were going to comprise that committee each and every week so gentlemen welcome and and thank you for being here our pleasure i don't say in missouri at all but <laughs> many do that's fine and i'm going to change my audio so it's the good phone right now how's this guys Ooh. is that better i, I yeah. can feel you now yeah. All right. I'm going to start because I, I want to say he wrote the most number of words in this offseason. We are all going to name our top five teams and try to whittle it down to a consensus top four because that's what the college football playoff will be from here on out and in, into the near future. So since he wrote the most words, Bill Connolly, who are the five best teams in the country after week four? Do you want all five or are we doing one at a time? Who is? Give me your number. Give me one team. Florida State. Florida State's a top five team. Defend Florida State as a top five team. Um, top five offense, top five defense. I mean, they, I realize after Pitt they really haven't played anybody since then, but right. they, I mean, they've dominated the bad teams like you're supposed to, and Pitt really might not be terrible, and they destroyed Pitt after the first five, six, seven minutes. So, I mean, they're top five, and we'll see if they can avoid whatever we want to call it, the Florida State, I mean, the Clemson, and whatever, but <laughs> they're, they're top five so far. All right, Jason Kirk, since you are next on my screen, give me a top five team. I'm going to go with LSU. The defend over, LSU. I will defend LSU. Not that they need any defending. They have a great defense. Yes, they the do. The win over TCU is one of the most impressive of the year considering the Horned Frogs are a very good team and they actually had both quarterbacks for that game. True. Uh, the win against Auburn, also impressive. It was in hand for basically the full 60 minutes and the weather against a against an unfamiliar and talented and frisky offense. They had LSU had the talent advantage, but still, you win by 14 against a Gus Malzahn team. That's a good win. Um, yet to be challenged in either of their other two games. Zach, Me Zach Mettenberger looks like the quarterback we thought we were getting last year. Um, I, I think you could make the case for LSU being number one right now. And obviously when you look at LSU's schedule, the trip-ups, even if LSU is a top-five team, the trip-ups appear to be, not surprisingly, Texas A&M and Alabama. Which team do you think is better suited to beat LSU at this point from what you've seen? And can an LSU loss come from elsewhere in the division? Well, Texas A&M, that game is in College Station, and uh, wait, wait, wait. Where is no, that no, game? it's in Baton Rouge. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're going to Alabama, so let me go with that one. Right. Um, based on just based on the teams, any team in that division could be a challenge for each other. Um, I think LSU is a very good challenge for Alabama, just based on the weakness that they've shown uh, against top wide receivers so far this year, the weakness mm -hmm. they've always had against um, against the deep ball. So maybe we go with A&M as the best shot to, uh, to take out LSU. Spencer Hall, give me a top five team. Uh, you know, everybody else is getting all hipstery. Picking on projections like a nerd would, Bill <laughs> Nerds! But you know what? Missionary position football has done us proud for, for <laughs> years now, so I'm going to keep it clean and Christian and stick with Alabama football. Okay. Because, because they're Alabama. Like, really, do, you want a reason? Like, they've played teams... They beat two different teams in two very different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. They uh, have A.J. McCarron, who is the best, most outstanding, thrilling, playmaking game manager in college football uh, and also needs to round into shape on defense, and I kind of trust Nick Saban to do that because uh, that's all they've done. That's fair. And so are they the number one team in the country. Should people be the most scared of Alabama, more scared than any other team in the country, though? I don't think they should be more scared. I would be way more scared of a team that could be uh, extremely unpredictable and blindside you. I don't think anything Alabama does blindsides anyone. You can't really be right. scared of you can't really be scared of uh, of a landslide because there's not much you can do about it. Right, uh, and that's what they do offensively, defensively. They do have some weaknesses, but I really doubt that there's going to be many people who can challenge them like Texas A&M did. Like that game was great, but it was also sort of sad because I really doubt past Ole Miss this weekend. 
uh, and maybe LSU, provided that this Zach Mittenberger renaissance is real. Uh, right. I don't really see anybody who can challenge them on the perimeter. And that's, again, the most important part about uh, about beating a Nick Saban hand-gesturing defense, right, is making <laughs> sure that you peel the top off of that defense, go down the perimeters, and open up those running lanes. What do you, how do you feel about Florida State matched up against either LSU or Alabama? I think that... It's so hard to tell what FSU, FSU is at this point because our only on-the-field contextual litmus test, like the numbers are awesome, and mm -hmm. they are doing everything they should, but their only litmus test is against Pitt in game yes. one. You know, Pitt, a, a team not exactly made to mount a challenge uh, after they give up a couple of scores, all right? And a team that, frankly, isn't even close to uh, Florida State in terms of what they've got in talent. I love Jameis Winston. He's really spectacular, and he could sort of, I think, be that element that takes them from this, you know, sort of wannabe point where they are now into something which is solid and competitive throughout a season. Right. But but this the context scares me. That is that is fair. I'm going to throw in the Oregon Ducks because they're scrappy, and I don't know much about them, but I feel good. No, they the Oregon team this year is as talented defensively. Even without the loss of, uh, even with the loss of Michael Clay and Kiko Alonso, they're as talented up front and built to compete with anybody more so than when people like to point to the losses against those SEC West schools. They're they're built to do something like that this year more than any other year. Uh, offensively, I feel good about them. I'm not crazy about the Anthony Thomas in that uh, sort of workhorse every down back role, but they appear to be probably more potent than ever because they're getting a ton from the wide receiver position this year. So that is my top five team. Um, we're going to, I don't know if we should, let's go to Jason Kirk with this one now. You're going to get, because you ah. have the second pick. Yeah. Jason Kirk. Give I'm going to, give me another team. I'm going to stay in the Pac-12. I'm going UCLA. The Whoa. Road win over, yeah, I said it. The road win over Nebraska, probably mm -hmm. the second most impressive road win of the season so far behind mm -hmm. Alabama winning at College Station. It was a comeback that turned into a blowout. A uh, home win against Nevada, that's also part of FSU's resume. Um, mm -hmm. UCLA looked just as impressive there. Uh, New Mexico State blowout, fine, we'll toss that on. Um, I just think offense and defense, it's a team that they're playing with heart. They're playing with a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, the Pac-12 is awesome this year. Them, Oregon, Stanford, Washington, all very good teams based on early returns. Um, I, I, I really like this UCLA team. Obviously. Is is UCLA good enough to win the Pac-12? I would not bet on it happening. They could challenge either Oregon or Stanford. Um, right. Maybe you know, maybe in the next two or three years they can get to that point. But right now, both of those teams are just too loaded. Okay, so their resume through four weeks has you convinced that they have played as a top five team thus far. I think if we end the season right now, I would have UCLA in there. All right, Bill Connolly. Give me another team, maybe perhaps off the beaten top ten path that perhaps, like Jason Kirk did, do you have is one of your five teams one of those? I mean, I, I was I, I was defeated because I thought Jason was going to claim Baylor, but now I get to I get to be the mm -hmm. the, uh, the Baylor representative here. Now, I mean, if we again, if we're talking about just what has happened in 2013 in September or August 31st to now, right? Baylor has been one of the top five teams in the country. They haven't played anybody. There, you know, we don't actually know how good they are yet, but you know, beating Louisiana Monroe 70 to seven. Uh, putting up almost 800 yards is something. Something, right? It's not. It's not beating Texas A&M in College Station, but it's something. And you know, they've just been so so good. They found another gear, and now they have to prove they can do it against Oklahoma and uh, you know this newly resurgent Texas defense that I, I heard about on Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but no, they just have to do it now in conference. They've done everything they possibly could in non-conference, and now we get to now we get to really find out how how seriously we're supposed to take them. Is there a reason beyond their first three games and Louisiana Monroe, not a terrible program these past couple of years, and they returned a ton? Is there a reason to believe that we should all believe in this Baylor defense? Probably not yet. Okay. I mean, <laughs> they. They have, again, passed the test they've been given, but Louisiana Monroe did. I mean, twice in the first quarter they drove down the field um, and then went for it on fourth down because you're not kicking field goals to beat Baylor, and they knew that. Right. Uh, so, I mean, it really could have been more like 21-14 to 14 after the first quarter, but it was still – they still didn't even gain 300 yards for the game. 
Um, we'll see. That's that's really all we can say. They they have not been other than the first quarter against Buffalo. It hasn't been a bad defense, right. but they still have a lot to prove in that regard. Spencer, off the beaten trail, do you have a team that is looking outside of the top ten that you feel could vault? We've seen it these past couple of years with Notre Dame and Auburn making big leaps. Is there maybe not outside of the top twenty five, but outside of the top ten, a team that intrigues? Uh, only because they've done it before, uh, and that's because, and also because of an improved defense, and that's Oklahoma State. Uh, I include that deliberately uh, because it fits my personal narrative. Because I'm going to Oklahoma State Baylor on November 23rd, <laughs> which could end up being a uh, surprisingly important and pivotal game in any national title chase pre-playoff. Uh, I mean, this would be. Uh, if the, we were playing it this year, this could be a play-in game. And it could be a play-in mm-hmm. game, by the way, uh, with a score in the mid-40s, at least, if they're at playing uh, the way both teams like it. And uh, hopefully that's juxt- juxtaposed against some really unwatchable trench warfare SEC game the same night. That would be good, so you can just flip back and forth, and Mike Gundy gets to say, is this what we want football to be? Because um, that would be nice for, for my purposes. But, but uh, on a serious level... Uh, there's no reason to think that that with what they're capable of offensively and with the improvement they've made over de- in defense over the past year or so, uh, that they couldn't make that change as well. I mean, they've they've been right there the past couple of years, so why not double down? Even though, by the way, they already switched quarterbacks because it's Oklahoma State. That's what they yep. do. <laughs> That's what they do. What what do you look at as a, a fatal flaw, perhaps, of Oklahoma State? You mentioned an improved defense. You mentioned turnover, of course, with the defensive coordinator. What? Where do you think a team like Baylor, like Texas, can exploit the Cowboys? Um, I think they have the opposite problem of someone uh, like Florida, for instance, okay? Who, by the way, like, full bias, me being a Florida fan, they're not far off of this top five list, strictly based on their defense. I agree. Uh, If they just, like, this would be an undefeated team well into November if they just held on to the ball. If they mm-hmm. just held on to the ball, and they could still, they're still very much a factor in an SEC race. But in a national scope, I would worry about the opposite problem with Oklahoma State. Uh, I would worry about them keeping pace offensively because I think that they are, wow. they are a bit diminished from what they were offensively. Potentials there, but uh, if they get into a, a gunfight with Baylor, for instance, uh, they're going to run out of bullets last. Interesting. Okay, that makes sense. I am going to bring Florida to the table for the very reason you said, in in that they may do one thing better than everybody in the country, and that's play defense and shut teams down on third downs. They make drives nearly impossible, and I don't know enough about Tyler Murphy other than the fact that they stole him away from Temple, Um, but if he's able to complete 58 to 62% of his passes and throw four touchdowns, five touchdowns for every interception, Florida's going to be essentially unbeatable with the home field advantage that they have. I don't know that he can do that, but right now, and I know they've lost a game and they lost that game ugly, but it's a different looking team, and I don't, I'm don't, i not ready to proclaim it a, a Kevin Hogan, Josh Nunes situation like we saw from Stanford last year and become a different team with a new quarterback, but when you can play defense like Florida plays, you have to be taken seriously as not just top ten, but perhaps top five. So that they're in my top five. Thoughts? Are you scared of Florida as a as as a team with that sort of pressure? Uh, I'm just always terrified of Florida. Period. So I okay. recuse, I recuse myself from the conversation. Okay, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna ask you now for another team. We're gonna snake back around. Give me a top five team we haven't mentioned. Uh, Louisville. Louisville. I just mentioned Louisville, whose fatal flaw is uh, their neighborhood, i.e. Yep. their schedule. Because their schedule is an atrocity. It's really bad. And they're doing everything they can with said atrocious schedule. They have two real advantages. Uh, one, they'll have Teddy Bridgewater hopefully upright at season's end, uh, because he's not going to get hit a lot. Right. And uh, two, it's, it's like a one or two game season, depending on how you look at it. So... Uh, the only way, like, if this were a playoff, this would be perfect for, for Louisville because, you know, they might get in on that final slot, that four spot, and then sneak in and then be fresh, rested, and ready from an entire season of playing FIUs. And everyone would hate it. You want to know, like, what a central point of uh, controversy could be? Whoever makes that four spot with a really weak schedule and then sweeps through. The New York Giants, right? The, the, the Coughlin plan, just sliding into the playoffs mm-hmm. uh, barely and getting in. That's going to be the central point of controversy, uh, someone like Louisville making it in. 
I'm going to go to Jason now, and I'm going to dovetail from the Louisville thing because they're ranked right now number seven, Jason. And I'm going to ask you to go through the, the five teams ranked beneath Louisville and on a neutral field who you would take. Are you ready? Yes, let's go. Okay, Louisville number seven, Florida State eight. I'm going to take Florida State. Georgia nine. I don't really trust Georgia anywhere, but uh, I'll, i got to go with the, the talent on defense there. I'm going to go with Georgia. Okay, uh, Texas A&M 10. I'm going to go Texas A&M. I think they're better than Georgia and Florida State. <laughs> Oklahoma State 11. Um, this is where it's getting tough. They're equally you know, equally unproven, I'd say. Um, right. That, that's where you're getting into toss-up territory, I think. Um, I'd have them over just about anybody below there, but right there, that's going to be the stopping point for me. <laughs> so South Carolina you would take... Uh, as a loser to Louisville? I think so at this point. But okay. that, that, that's one that could change. But at this All right. Point, yeah. Give me a team. I'm going to add Clemson to the mix. The winner Clemson. of Georgia. Uh, it was a home win. It was a close win that could have gone either way. They have obvious flaws, but they still beat perhaps uh, the best team anybody's beat so far this year. The win over NC State was a road win, a Thursday nighter in a tricky spot that has upset Clemson before and Florida State before. NC State plays well and plays dangerous at home. Mm -hmm. um, those are two good wins, so I, I think I think Clemson deserves to be here too. Where, other than Florida State, is the opportunity for Clemson to drop a game? And there's also the finisher at South Carolina, obviously, mm -hmm. and then there's the ACC schedule. It, it, does this, Maryland does should Maryland game. scare Clemson fans? Yes, Maryland oh. is dangerous this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Granted, West Virginia's down, and Maryland hasn't really beaten anybody else of of significant concern. But right. you know, Randy Edsel, for as much as we made fun of him for years and years, it, it's finally starting to pay off. He's got some guys who are apparently experienced after filling in for uh, a, a a a roster that gets split in half every season. So. It's a very talented team, and that could be the team that takes down Clemson if anybody does. Bill Connolly, give me a team. Well, I was going to say, too, Clemson's uh, road schedule in conference is Syracuse, Maryland, Virginia, uh, remaining. It's not bad. And, I mean, a pretty good team could lose one of those games without being Clemson. So, you know, it's it's certainly not a guarantee, but you have to like the fact that they're going to be favored just about from here on out, at least until South Carolina. Um you know, I'd like I'd like to get creative and pick like a you know Oklahoma or something, but Ohio State hasn't been claimed yet, so I'm, sure. I got to pick Ohio State um, if, if we're doing a draft style here. They really do. I mean, they have two good quarterbacks, and that's something yeah, almost yeah. nobody in the country can have or can say. And their defense, I, I still have a lot of questions about that defense. Questions that will be answered in the next two weeks against Wisconsin and Northwestern. But yeah, I mean, they're not claimed yet. They need to be. So Ohio State. So when you match Ohio State up against other top five programs that we've mentioned or will mention, where do you feel like Ohio State matches up best with any of these teams? Where are they strongest? Where I mean, you mentioned the two quarterbacks. Is it the passing game? Is it the versatile options that those quarterbacks give you? Where is Ohio State the most lethal? Well, I think, you know, if they really do, we'll have to see what they do from here on out, how much they're going to use both quarterbacks and everything like that. But... I mean, they have a lot going for them on offense now, especially if they have at least the threat of Guyton coming in and maybe passing a little better than Braxton Miller does. So, um, yeah, right now they can do everything with one quarterback or the other on the offensive side of the ball, and that's clearly very dangerous. Uh, defense, again, front seven is very, very, very raw, and we'll see what they do against Wisconsin. But, uh, yeah, that offense right now, they have every weapon. It's just, you know, you have to have two different quarterbacks on the field to get to maximize those. Should they play two quarterbacks if both are healthy? Absolutely. Call, at the same time. At the same time. Call, yeah. call, call only, only at the same time. Exclusively. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, that's just a rotation, and that's ugly and messy. Yeah. Yeah, no, if they could, yeah, this is the perfect opportunity for us to see what a two-quarterback offense looks like. No, I mean, I think they will probably, if I had to guess, I would say they might end up in some sort of rotation situation just because Guyton looks so, so good. But, um, I mean, we'll see. It's, there are a lot of different things that they can do here. I assume they won't really do a two-quarterback uh, offense uh, as much as we, you know, in the blogosphere want that to happen. But, no, they, I mean, they've got a lot of options, and I think that's really big. Spencer Hall, which of the teams that we've mentioned do you feel like 
you would want to play against if you are a head coach? Which team is the most vulnerable? I would say this. I think the team that is most vulnerable that we've talked about uh, since we haven't talked about Georgia yet. Um, <laughs> you, I think we just started to. I think we just started to, didn't we? Uh, I think the team that we've talked about uh, that, that's most vulnerable, if you're looking at them, is probably, it, in, and I think most volatile at the same time, is probably Baylor because of the defense. I mean, if they commit, yep. to, if they commit to turnovers and you've got a decent offense, uh, you're probably going to be able to sit on them for a while and really take the air out of the game. The hypothetical, say, Baylor-Florida matchup mm -hmm. or your Baylor-Alabama oh, wow. matchup. Yeah, the Baylor-Florida matchup would be the biggest contrast in styles you've ever seen. It would be your King Hippo versus your, uh, you know, Piston Honda kind of matchup. If you're, mm -hmm. you know, into those kind of metaphors, mm -hmm. mongoose, mongoose versus tortoise. That's what we're saying. <laughs> uh, so I think they're vulnerable there. I think another team that's very vulnerable when you start to look at their style of play. Uh, you know, Alabama has a vulnerability in the terms that they've managed to play their opponent's game. For right. a lot of quarters this year, right? They they played like Virginia Tech would, you know, winning on yeah. special teams. They played like Texas A and M did in a, in a shootout. That's mm -hmm. a weakness and a strength because they've shown that they can win games in very different manners. But at the same time, uh, that's got to be kind of worrisome for the Alabama fan who would like every game to look exactly the same. Run the ball! Run the ball! Come on, Nuss! Run the ball! Okay. Okay, I'm going to throw Georgia in now just because I've been prompted to. And there's a lot to like about this Georgia team on offense. And I, I'm going to stick to my Florida theory in that if you can do something really well, and Georgia has two very good running backs, they have a very good two deep uh, offensive line with a lot of experience. They've got one of the better quarterbacks, not just in the conference, but in the country. Um, and even without Malcolm Mitchell, there is there's talent to be had between uh, Arthur Lynch, now Reggie Davis playing well on the outside, and Michael Bennett. So Georgia scares me a little bit just because of their schedule. Um, I believe, let's see, they have Florida on the neutral site. They've already played South Carolina. Um, they've, they have momentum from last season and believing they can get to the SEC championship game. And the defense last year wasn't all that good, and they got to the SEC East championship game stage, whatever it is. Um, so I'm going to go Georgia. I don't feel great about them, but I feel like they can do enough to win in, in different ways in shootouts on the ground. They can play physically, and they still have Mike Bobo, which I think hurts them. But, um, yeah. Take that, Bill? <laughs> okay, this is why I think that it hurts them, Bill, and you can take it from here. I think it hurts <laughs> them because... Their offense may have been, and this is this is quoting you, the best in the country on a, a per play level, and they just didn't play quickly. But the third down stuff against Clemson, I feel like, is a direct result of, I won't say nerves, but sort of unease with this team after a, an off season, and I was a little disappointed with that. Now, counterpoint my Mike Bobo third down trepidation, Bill. Well, the counterpoint would be Gurley was hurt for a little while, and Mitchell was out sure. for the game. So, I mean, you know, depending on what their game plan was coming in, that might have kind of tossed the game plan up in the air. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we don't have to wait long to find out, uh, you know, who's right here because LSU comes to town. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't – Georgia's defense actually did just fine against North Texas, only like two real drives. They had the two mm -hmm. special teams touchdowns. Uh, so maybe that unit's okay. But, yeah, we'll, we'll obviously, because of the schedule, we'll know everything we need to know about Georgia pretty quickly. All right. Bill, give me a team. Um, I believe this know, is the last team. Okay. Mike Downing has already gone. Well, we, we've each done three so far. So. Then that's not true. <laughs> we <laughs> well, have two more teams. To talk about. Um, actually, I am going to go Oklahoma because their defense is good, and uh, because you know we'll see what Blake Bell does against a real defense. Tulsa might actually be pretty terrible this year. Yeah. But um, but you know if, if Blake Bell can move the ball against Notre Dame then, you know, they ha already have one of probably the two best defenses in the conference. Suddenly, if they go to South Bend and win, then you're looking at a situation, it's really going to be hard to run the table in the Big 12, but they might have the best odds of doing it. What changed about this defense year to year? Um, well, last year, they, you know, they had pr one of the best secondaries in the country, and their defensive line was terrible. Yep. Um, this year in the offseason, they seem to have made a lot of, 
you know, adjustments. They understand that their defensive line is terrible and they have to adjust around it. And you're seeing a lot of like three down linemen and things like that. Uh, and they still, despite the losses in the secondary, it's still a really good secondary. So mm-hmm. I think they just had an off season to prepare for the fact that their line isn't uh, Austin English 2007 good. And you know, they're, they're, the tinkering seems to have worked so far. We'll see if it continues to work. But again, you know, ULM is not amazing, but holding them to whatever it was, like 140 yards, uh, right. is pretty ridiculously good. So um, we just have to see if the offense is real like it was against Tulsa. Jason Kirk, give me a team. My top five is all already here, so another team to consider for the on-deck circle would be... That was a baseball reference, I believe. Oh, I think I might have used it correctly. Pretty gay. Um, is Washington. Yes. A, a blowout of Boise State, which we haven't seen in years. Mm-mm. A Boise State team that's down, but uh, you know, a Boise State team that nobody really wants to play. Right. And a veritable road win over Illinois, which is better than Illinois has been. Mm-hmm. And then a shutout of lowly Idaho State. Um, I think those three wins can stack up. They have a very, very good running game. Should have a very good offense for the whole rest of the season. Bishop Sankey might be the best back in the country. Uh, other than maybe Lake Seastrunk or you know some of the some of the other speed Jeremy guys. Hill, yeah. You know they're they're a lot of contenders, but he's right up there. So I wouldn't have Washington there, but with a few more wins, they could sneak in. When you look at Washington's schedule, which is about to the about to roll off Arizona, Stanford, Oregon, and Arizona State. Can they go three and one against that? Uh, no, they might go zero and three, but <laughs> against four teams. <laughs> oh wait, wait, I, I missed one. I missed one. They're going to yeah, defer. There will be a forfeit. They'll just defer. There will be a running clock <laughs> accidentally requested by Ron Turner before the game even begins. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean it's going to get hard. We're going. We have questions about Washington, and we're going to find out exactly where they stand very soon. Um, a home game against Arizona. Oregon at home, eh, that could be tricky, but I, if two and two, we'll call two and two here a success. Oh yeah. That this week's Arizona Washington game, by the way, I don't know if it's a night game, I don't know if it's the late game. I should probably have that in front of me. Um, that could secretly be one of the more entertaining. It's a seven Eastern game, so it's going up against a couple other good games, but that's gonna be real fun. That's, I mean, Washington's much better on defense. Offensively, it's it's a lot simpler. Um, I agree with that pick. Does anybody have anything bad to say about this Washington pick? Because I'm an Oregon fan, and I like hearing things like that. I, I like you saying. I like you going ahead and putting in the gentle slam of saying, "Oh, things are a lot simpler on offense for them." <laughs> That's what I was told by Washington people. As you, as you sit, as you sit from your Oregon throne, <laughs> it's the very cute what they do. Chip Kelly just left you like some benevolent alien. He did. He very much. It actually, no, I do mean that in a weird compliment because as teams simplify things, that was the Oregon strength over the years is when they would kill teams, they were running three plays. <laughs> if they were running inside, outside zone and some weird play action concepts. It was not a complicated thing they were doing. They were just doing it quickly. And Washington figured out that we have fast people. We can make things simple and get them out in space. So that was a compliment, but I, I, my tone was not an accident. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, they had experience this year. That's yeah. I mean, they were so so young last year. So that that alone, I mean, even if they don't change anything, things get simpler when you have more experience behind you. So true. And they've been recruiting very well for a few yeah. years, and that's starting to pay off. Very very true. Tosh Lupoi, totally on the level as a worth recruiter. Worth every dime. Worth every dime. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spencer Hall, give me a team. Uh, you know, bullish on the Pac-12 this year, mm-hmm. and I'm not really even sure why. Uh, but because uh, Stanford, uh, just their efficiency mm-hmm. and the way that they managed to finish games. For instance, um, Arizona State uh, did manage to mount a comeback, and Stanford plays unemotional clinical ball, which means that per the spreadsheet, they say you pull the starting quarterback. Well, yeah. <laughs> they did, and Arizona start, State started to creep in. So how did they finish the game? They finished the game with eight runs that bled over five minutes off the clock <laughs> out of these giant formations with 300 tight ends, right? But mm-hmm. my favorite, by the way, in, a, in this broadcast, right, they're talking about a wide receiver. I can't remember which one who said, oh, you're not going to convert me to a tight end, are you, David Shaw? This was in the recruiting <laughs> process. And I was like, how fundamentally do you misunderstand the concept of Stanford football at this point? where you're even worrying if someone is a tight end. They're all tight ends, right? They're I mean, all tight everyone's ends. Everyone's going to play this slamming, blocking football on every position, right? And the way they finish games is brutal. It's efficient. It's ugly. 
Uh, they don't sweat the small games. If you watch the Army game, by the way, uh, maybe like four plays. Maybe, uh, you know, didn't try anything outlandish. Every, you know, they only did stuff differently every now and then to keep their players awake. And that's really what Stanford tries to do. They're, they're going to boil the season down to like two or three games. Is I, I absolutely would have picked Stanford had I realized that they were still on the board yeah. instead of Oma, Shame but. on you, Connolly. Well, yeah, and I, would, I would point out about Stanford that if you know if it was a, a power ranking situation or just a top 25, I think you know Stanford would be in everyone's top three. But just if we're going based on resumes right. from a selection committee perspective, you know, then they're just not there yet. No, they they, they certainly aren't. But but as a ticket, if my other picks have been taken, which all but one have, uh, I will go ahead and take Stanford just because if you're going to finish a game if it's tied in the fourth quarter, they're going to be horrendous to face. Yeah, no, it's going to be trouble. And bas they're basically pornography to Brady Hoke. He can't, he can't do what they do, but all he's trying to do is recruit tight ends and defensive ends and offensive linemen. That's all he wants out of life is to build a team like that. And thanks, Devin Gardner. You're ruining everything. You're ruining Brady Hoke's porn. You're ruining Brady Hoke's porn. Does anybody want to take Michigan? No. no. I don't. No. Nope. I, from a quality perspective, hell no. But by the end of the year... Uh, this could be a team that we look at their resume, and it's a sort of a Notre Dame situation. They've beaten right. everybody by two points, and oh, you have to include them. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, if they, they knock like, off Ohio State they, and they're undefeated, what are we to do? You can't blame uh, us. It, it, ball security for them is yeah. a is a nightmare, and Devin Gardner is the starting point for all of that. I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to take Texas A&M because they have not been mentioned yet, and because they probably play offense better than everybody in the country not named Baylor or Oregon, I feel like doing something excellently deserves recognition. Texas A&M, maybe half a team. They're probably like 63% of a really good team, but I feel like their ceiling on any given Saturday um, is, is as high as anybody's in the country. They, they put up record yardage against Alabama, something that nobody in the country, I don't think Oregon could have done what, what Texas A&M did that day. I think Oregon can beat Alabama, but not in that sort of dominant way uh, offensively. So I'm going Texas A&M just because they have the opportunity to prove it ahead of, ahead of their schedule right now, going to LSU, playing the Mississippi schools, and they do offense, they do that thing better than pretty much everybody else does anything. So I'm going Texas A&M, but not thrilled about it. You no. picked three SEC teams, by the way. Yeah, you homer. I didn't say what? You picked three <laughs> SEC teams, by the way. <sighs> well, I was, thinking, I was thinking Washington earlier. I was not thinking UCLA. Um, I'm just trying to think of th teams that nobody has taken. Northwestern. We'll see. Nobody? Yeah. Nobody on Northwestern. Not, not yet. Crickets. Okay. No, can, I, can I can I put can I put one real distant curveball? One. Please do. Uh, as somebody who I think this team's gonna like their ceiling is like ten and two, and that okay. would require some freakiness down the stretch. But uh, Texas Tech, right there. Like I just really? Texas Tech is like right there. In terms of, uh, so far they've been lucky. I like that. There's mm -hmm. no empirical evidence whatsoever to support that, but I still like it. Uh, they've shown the ability to finish games, and yep. uh, they have an extremely aggressive and positive coach, which yep. if you have a very young team, it helps to be mindlessly aggressive and extremely positive. Additionally, the, the defense won't fall apart for a couple of years. <laughs> That's true. Very true. At least one. At least nine months. They're going to get like nine to ten months of great defense. Nobody on Notre Dame, Ole Miss, Wisconsin, Fresno State, Miami. Oh, I'm on Wisconsin. That's, I'm, all, I'm all about Wisconsin. You're all about Wisconsin. They, that, that loss will cost them, and they'll probably lose again this coming weekend, but I really, really like Wisconsin. You like Wisconsin. The, the running backs look as probably more athletic than they've yeah. looked ever. The, the speed oh, yeah. for turning eight yards into 47 is unprecedented in Madison. Is their defense good enough transitioning? Is Joel Stave an entire season BCS quarterback? Well, I mean, Stave has already... Well, I'm not going to blame him for the end of the Arizona State game, but they've already tripped up in a game where if they had a little bit more in the passing department, they could have probably won. Right. So I think Stave... I really liked him, his little small sample size last season, but... Uh, he's a bit of a weakness. I don't mind the defense at all. I think it's a solid defense at the very least. 
All right, we're going to go across the board now. Jason Kirk, which of these teams should make up the top four? My top four at this point in the season, based on resumes, would be LSU, Oregon, Alabama, and UCLA. Bill Connolly. Um, sorry, I'm going to log these. Oh, please do log. <laughs> of course you are. Yeah, because my are. mathematics is not LSU, where it needs Oregon, to be. UCLA, and who? Uh, Bama. Alabama. Uh, All right, Spencer. Not happy about it, but Bama. Spencer, who should be in the playoffs? Um, I would go with this. Uh, let's see, you had LSU. I'm going to go ahead and take, uh, I will take Alabama, I will take Clemson, I will take Oregon, and I will take, um, I'm really trying not to take another SEC team, and I really want to. UCLA, Stanford, how about that? Wow, UCLA over Stanford. Yes, at this okay. point. Just because of the Nebraska win. The Nebraska win for me was because I really don't think Nebraska is that bad. I think offensively. True. The, the thing that impressed me was shutting down Nebraska's offense. I'm going to ride that for now. Okay. Um, Bill, do you have a top four teams as it stands now in late September? Florida State. I, I, yeah, Florida State. Um, LSU, Oregon. I don't want to pick Alabama. I really, really want to pick Baylor, but I'll go out. It was 17-6 to six after three quarters against Colorado State. Yes. Two, two touchdowns against Virginia Tech on offense. Absolutely. At very, very clear reasons. And if, I, you know, if we're judging solely on the four-week resume, they probably aren't top four. If you gave me a number one, a top 25 vote, they're still number one. I just they get the benefit of the doubt for me. But it, no, okay. From okay. last well, yeah. year? Huh? Because of last year? Kind of. You know, if we're talking only about this year's resume, then it would have to be something like uh, Florida State, LSU, Oregon, or either Baylor or UCLA, I guess. Okay. I'm going to go LSU, Oregon, Florida State, LSU, Oregon, Florida State. I'm going to say Stanford because of that first half against ASU, what appears to be a, a pretty good ASU team to be able to stomp on them like that, and it is it does come back to the ruthless efficiency. Two Pac-12, two SEC. So well, while Bill's tallying that, the yeah. case for Alabama, since we you know we never actually made the case, like you, right. you need the evidence. Um, I think we look at the Virginia Tech win. That was a win against a very good defense, based on what we've seen the rest of the season in a weird yeah. environment. The win yeah. over Texas A&M, a win against arguably the best offense in the country in the most fired-up Kyle Field ever, yep, which is on the saying a damn lot. Yep. Um, and then a 25-point squeaker at home that you know that didn't look like a 25-point uh, right. narrow victory. But there are obvious concerns with the Tide, but I think based on the resume, I think they're in there. And, you know, I, I like Bill and, you know, like everyone here, I tried to find a reason not to include them just because it feels too obvious and it feels like too just an easy pick. But just based on what they've done, I think they're in there. Can I give uh, you a uh, can I give you a fun stat about Alabama? Sure. At this point in the season for total defense, who has a higher total defense ranking? Okay, and by that I mean lower. South Alabama or Alabama? <laughs> One's 52nd so and is. the other's 56th, and 52 is not Alabama. It would well, be you, you look on a map and Tuscaloosa's here and Mobile's here. <laughs> Should be down there. Although, I will say that the Manziel effect, it'll be really funny to go back and graph a, what your defensive ranking is before you face Texas A&M <laughs> and after throughout the course of the season. That's, that's entirely fair. Bill, how you doing? Um, I have no idea what people voted for, but I'm pretty sure it's Oregon and LSU are definitely in. Okay. And then we're looking at some, you know, a split of UCLA, Alabama, Florida State. I think Clemson and Stanford only got one vote each. So basically two out of UCLA, Alabama, and Florida State. So mm. we should come to a consensus. Um, I, I, would would... Su I would suggest UCLA because we, we heard them a couple times. Yeah. So let's go LSU, Oregon, UCLA, and what was the other team that we heard twice? I think Florida State. So Florida State or Alabama, basically. Florida State or Alabama, who is more deserving? A Florida State team that has played Bethune-Cookman, Nevada, and Pitt, an Alabama team that has looked very good at times and squeaky at times, uh, but has, I, I will say Alabama. Hey, what's that, what's that record say? Huh? <laughs> record says undefeated. Says undefeated right there. Um, so I think I think are we in consensus now? Alabama, Oregon, LSU, UCLA. 
That works for me. Okay, there it is. Did not expect UCLA to be in there, although I am terrified of them as an Oregon fan and excited to watch what they're able to do the rest of the season. Uh, Brett Hundley, legitimate Heisman candidate? Yeah, we'll see. Anthony yeah. Barr, legitimate decapitation candidate? Oh, Absolutely. yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, so there's the consensus on, on UCLA. Any parting shots, any of you? Well, Fresno State. State. Oh, go ahead. Fresno State, laying in the weeds. That's it. It's Tim DeRuiter time. <laughs> this basically means we're looking at Oregon versus Alabama and LSU versus UCLA. That sounds fun. That sounds real fun. <laughs> oh, God. Oregon, Alabama. So who, who would you put in the final? Who would you put in the championship? Here's the, here's the thing about Alabama. We picked them last, but I still pick them to beat any of these teams. So, yeah, if I, had to, if I had to wager actual money, it, it might still be the Tide. Right, I mean, so, I mean, we're, we're, this whole exercise is why we don't have a four-week season, but yeah. I would say Alabama-LSU, as awesome as that sounds. Ugh. Yeah, Kirk? by the way, I, I really like, uh, I really like, it, it, listen, if any year, if there's going to be any year where LSU breaks this 9-6, 10-7, smashy-faced football match and just lays it on Alabama... And, and LSU and Alabama fans know this, it would be this year because yeah. of the way LSU is built and the way that passing game can go vertical and the way Jeremy Hill, who has just unreal capabilities as a running back, mm -hmm. uh, can balance them out the middle. I, I mean, they're going to be a handful in terms of what they present offensively for the Tide. And you can move the ball against Alabama. Like, it, it's not the team of the past couple of years. The front three for the Tide when they do play only three down linemen, which I think is only about half the time, is not getting the same push without without Mount whatever and <laughs> and Jesse Williams from last year, Mount Cody. They're not get they're not the same team right there, at least right now. No, well, I think I think those are all fair points. So uh, Jason, well, any parting what, shots? Uh, Jim Mora versus Les Miles for greatest playoff press conference <laughs> matchup ever. <sighs> That is nice. That is nice. I, I have never even given thought to, to playoff press conference matchups. You, you have to think about this. And thing. now I'm going to obsess. Thank, thank you very much. All of you, uh, Bill, thank you very much for your tabulation and overall <laughs> knowledge and enthusiasm for everything. Jason, thank you very much for your cackling and knowledge. Uh, <laughs> Spencer, thank you very much for your jokes and knowledge. Uh, my pleasure. All right. Thank you for watching. We will see you next week, Monday evening, Eastern Time on the Selection Committee.